So I'm talking about uh, Marvel Comics uh, MCU, the Marvel Comics, uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe, excuse me. Um, so, and, and uh, it's oriented around Black Panther, so we had to have the Black Panther soundtrack. Yeah. There we go, we're just, just about ready. Okay, you, you, you tell me what to do here. I hope y'all don't mind. I'm, I'm gonna do the thing over here because I have too much stuff written down for my phone to work, so I have to forgive the the technology issues. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. now, you you want me to advance for you? Ah, oh, shit. Awesome. Hell yeah. So yeah, you just go nuts and I'll... Okay, cool. Alright, then, um, yeah, we can, we can turn the music. Alright, so, uh, my name is Javier Alanis. Uh, this is, uh, my talk is on Wakanda as Tipping Point, um, representation in Marvel Studios films before and after Black Panther. Alright, so, um, as I said, my name is Javier Lee Alanis. Uh, growing up in Wisconsin, um, that name doesn't necessarily align. Uh, it's not congruent with uh, my skin tone, um, how I look and see. Can we hit the music? The what? The music. Oh, yes. Yes. Cool. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm half white, uh, half Chicano, and what uh, brought me to Marvel Comics uh, was the, the ways in which the X-Men especially and a lot of the other characters at Marvel Comics um, represented that. Um, outsider, um, somebody not uh, mainstream, not the norm. Um, you know, I think everyone, everyone who I um, met as a kid, especially substitute teachers, had a terrible time with my name. Uh, and, and aligning those two things, I always knew that I was uh, different in some way, even though I present as as white exclusively, um, without an accent, without a, you know dark skin tone. Um, and you know, had I had I been born into a matriarchy, my name uh, would have been uh, Lee Kerwin. That's my middle name, named after my uncles Javier on my dad's side and Lee on my mom's side. Um, my mom's last name is Kerwin. Um, so Marvel Comics spoke to me uh, because I always had that outside mentality. Um, and uh, so yeah, um, this idea of representation was always present in Marvel Comics and uh, in my mind um, because of all these characters, right? Um, and, and many others. Uh, while it wasn't uh, as, as much of a kind of a, mm, part of the, um, the ether, like the, the consciousness um, as it was back, to, or right now, as it is right now, um, it was still present, it was still there. Um, so, y'all probably remember, uh, back in um, 2015, the hashtag Oscar So White, uh, I think this is when uh, representation kind of exploded on the scene. Um, and this is a, a hashtag from April Rain, um, uh, which helped expand awareness uh, of, of representation as an urgent issue for, for the country, um, particularly on screen. Um, but it has always been a problem. My, uh, my, favorite, uh, my favorite illustration of this, yeah, you can go to the next one. My favorite illustration of this is uh, an artist uh, named Alison Bechtel, who, who wrote a, a book called Dykes to Watch Out For, and, and many others, an uh, indie comic artist. If you don't know her, you should check her out. Um, and the, uh, she has something called the, well, she popularized, uh, somebody else came up with it uh, before her, but the Alison Bechtel, the Bechtel Wallace test. So as you can see um, here, the Bechtel Wallace test, three simple rules for the Bechtel Wallace test. Uh, you only go to a movie, this is the character, right? It has three basic requirements. One, it has to have at least two women in it. They changed that to be two named women, <laughs> as opposed to faceless general women, um, who, who talk to each other about, who talk to each other, sorry, that's the second one. They talk to each other about something other than a man. Very simple test, right? You'd think that that would be a very easy bar for Hollywood and media to pass. Turns out it's not. Um, just to show you how easy it is, it's an extremely low bar. Here's a comic that passes it in one panel. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I love the reframe here where after minor tweaks, Bechtel test is a hit. <laughs> minor tweaks, just change them into men. <laughs> so just by way of example, um, most superhero films don't pass the Bechtel test, Bechtel Wallace test. Uh, so this one, I think it just measures uh, from 2010 to 2017. Um, Marvel and DC, just a little comparison, side-by-side -side comparison, and that, and that includes all of the Marvel films, not just MCU. Um, 14, only 14 out of 25 for Marvel, and only 10 out of 25 from DC. So um, I'm not gonna go into, I don't have the time to go in deep on why representation matters. Um, trust that it does. There's a lot of research behind it. Um, when people see themselves on screen, um, it's important. They, they see themselves as part of a narrative and having a narrative and ha um, having agency and having a reason um, and, 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 and seeing themselves as heroes, all of this is important. Um, and so just a few quotes here um, from, some of the, uh, from some of the research. Uh, Gross and Gerbner back in the 70s. Uh, representation, I thought this was a powerful one. Representation in the fictional world signifies social existence and absence means symbolic annihilation. Annihilation of yourself and of your people, who you are, your identity. Um, moreover, the, the, the ways in which folks show up in these negative uh, stereotypes and images um, help to, to support all of the standard narratives of American history that we continue to pe perpetuate ourselves through all of our media. Um, those narratives of white supremacy, patriarchy, heteronormativity, Christian hegemony, and the manifest destiny of capitalist imperialism across the globe. Um, so by, by way of illustrating just like what the situation is in Hollywood, uh, this little infograph just shows the d diversity gap, specifically in the Academy Awards, um, from 87 years, from 1927 to 1915. You can see that from all the Academy branches, 98%, 98% in producers, writers, and actors, and actors, 88% white. So that's the winner right there, 88% white. Best actress winners, 99% white. Best actor, 92. Best director, 99, 93. This one is gender. Um, here too, male, female, 76% male. These are Academy voters. Um, just in case you're not aware of the extreme lack of uh, diversity of representation uh, amongst the Academy. This is where why Oscars so white is a, a hashtag and um, a huge uh, issue of uh, awareness for them. All right, so let's talk Marvel Comics. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the, the comic books, there's, there's always been a strain of representation. Uh, Black Panther very early um, in, in Jack Kirby and Stan Lee's work. Um, but specifically, I want to just look at some of the recent shining successes of representation at Marvel. Um, so, all right, Sana Amina is, is one of my heroes. Um, she is incredible. Um, Muslim American, Pakistani American um, editor. There's not a lot of... <laughs> There's not a lot of er editors who I, I think who get called a hero or a heroine, um, but she certainly is one for me. Um, she, along with G. Willow Wilson, um, created Kamala Khan, the first Muslim American superhero in Marvel Comics, um, based in Jersey City. Uh, if you haven't read any Ms. Marvel, you should. It's amazing. Um, another uh, triumph for Marvel recently uh, is unable to control her powers. Very powerful, but can't control them. Uh, and also is called a witch. <laughs> uh, luckily, they don't put a scarlet letter on her, but um, she is the scarlet witch, so. Um, and then all of the other characters with a modicum of power, the, the aliens, the Asgardians, um, they, like I said before, they have this, this basically just a general fighting ability, um, very indistinct, not, not, not really separate from each other, um, except perhaps the, in the case of um, three of them, Frigga, Nova Prime, and Aisha, this is Aisha. You, you guys might know some of these characters. Um, and whose power seems to be ineffective leadership of entire civilizations um, and getting outmaneuvered by the deception of really intelligent, sneaky men. Um, and so Black Widow, just want to talk about her for a minute. Um, she's, she's notable as the first uh, woman uh, Avenger. Um, unfortunately, um, while there's a lot of things to love about her and, and all of these characters, really, there's a lot of great things. There are problems overall when you look at all of the the, the the representation here together. Um, and it seems primarily uh, her, her major value to the team is emotionally manipulating uh, men um, and controlling men, uh, whether by playing on their assumptions of feminine ineptitude or their kind of sexual romantic interest in her, um, particularly in the case of uh, Banner Hulk by soothing his uncontrollable rage. 
Um, and then one final character, um, the Ancient One. I don't know how many folks are familiar with this, but uh, the, the casting of uh, Tilda Swinton in, in, as the Ancient One was uh, kind of a controversy in and of itself. Um, she was gender ambiguous, uh, kind of a whitewashing of a problematic Asian trope. So um, this is the status of women in the Marvel Cinematic Universe up to um, Spider-Man Homecoming and prior to Black Panther. Taken as a whole, you could infer that the Mar in the Mar Marvel Universe, femininity is weakness. Okay, so, um, by the way, oh boy, I'm going too slow. Okay, so, um, all right, so we're moving on to men of color. Um, I'm not gonna go through them in, in as much detail. Um, what I will say is, um, the, the, the biggest challenge for the men of color, um, there, there's a lot of great characters here, um, but they tend to be, um, uh, they tend to be the stakes. Uh, Gail Simone came up with a term called fridging, where, whereby um, characters, women, in, this, in, in the case that she was talking about, are killed, um, so as to motivate the white male protagonist of a story. Um, many of uh, the characters here have had that happen to them. Um, many of them, uh, I guess I might be spoiling things if I point out, uh, a number of them have had it happen to them twice, because they died and came back, and then died again to motivate white men. Okay, can you hit the next one? All right, I'm going to go through a little bit quicker. All right, um, so just to point out that there's absolutely no representation up to that, up, as of now, um, for uh, queer folks and for Native folks at all. And there are so many white guys. <laughs> These are just the ones who have a movie where they are the lead. I didn't even include all the supporting characters because I don't have enough room. <laughs> All right, so Marvel TV, basically, I don't have time for, the, for it in the scope here, so moving forward. Oops. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just gonna move a little quicker. Mm -hmm. All right, so real quick, here's, I can take over this one. Okay, go for it. Thanks. Um, so this, here's some of just the numbers for Black Panther. One of the most successful movies of all time. Uh, Worldwide, 1.3 billion and still counting. Uh, domestic total to date, currently the third highest grossing domestic film of all time. Not superhero film, not film by a black director, film. Uh, as I say on there, in a country that's founded upon and entangled in white supremacy, uh, that means something, it means a lot. Um, Hollywood success at this level is incredibly important. So um, I want to take a look at um, how this was accomplished. And the point here, what's so great about um, Black Panther is that it was accomplished because of, not in spite of the black representation that was uh, in every aspect of the film. So these folks are the folks behind the camera. Right, uh, from left to right, Ryan Coogler, a 31-year-old, uh, three films, Fruitvale Station, Creed, and Black Panther, Hannah Beachler, Ruth E. Carter, Joe Robert, Nate Moore, Camille Friend, who, um, Camille Friend is the second from the right there, um, who is the hairstylist, I'm sorry, the third from the right. Um, the hairstylist in the Black Panther, given the ways in which black hair has been uh, politicized um, and uh, a target of white supremacy, uh, her work in um, Black Panther it cannot be underestimated. Um, Tarin Finley article at HuffPost uh, talks more about each one of these folks. Um, and I think uh, the impact of Kendrick Lamar's soundtrack that I've walked into, uh, mm -hmm. dropping the week before the film's release, can't be underestimated. Okay, um, what I, what I, I'm running out of time, sorry Troy. Um, so I want to talk about quickly the, um, the ways in which uh, black power and ownership really drove the success of this film. Uh, the funding campaigns in here in Milwaukee and in many cities to, to ensure, uh, ensure that uh, black children who wouldn't otherwise have been able to see the film made, were able to see the brilliance and diversity, the depth and nuance and power and vulnerability present in, in Black Panther. <clears throat> I think I'm frozen. Might just be a... Oh, there we go. Okay, um, and one of the other things that really drove the, the success of this film and, um, and, and another example of the ownership was the ways in which um, 
all of these think pieces and articles and analysis, analysis both beforehand and after, uh, built this environment where seeing it once left you uh, unequipped, ill-equipped to actually be a part of the conversation. Um, and so a lot of folks tried to dismiss or simply simplify Black Panther, um, but there's a lot of the ca powerful counter arguments, um, most ex uh, exceptionally articulated by Benjamin Dixon, highlight the intentionality and, and narrative depth that, uh, that have been interwoven in through all of the characters um, and their positions. Um, so uh, I'm assuming, again, most folks have seen it, but um, a lot of the reduction of the film and tried to simplify it basically between Team T'Challa and Team Killamonger. Um, and, uh, and Dixon really um, talked about the ways in which um, uh, that Ryan Coogler, the director, wasn't really, a what his, here's a quote from Dixon. Coogler wasn't asking the audience to choose between those two. He was asking the audience to see ourselves in the blurred lines of heroes and villains, where we, the viewers, are both victims and monsters. Um, great writing about Black Panther. Uh, and I can share the link here for anybody who wants to catch up. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about moving forward. Um, one of the great things that uh, Coogler and the team did was um, really built a, a whole range of characters who can sustain, it's a world within a world. Um, Black Panther was an origin film that established all of these characters as um, all folks who could interact and hold their own stories even without interacting with the broader Marvel Cinematic Universe. Much like uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates before, Ryan Cooler is in this position now of having, um, at 31 years old, directed the third largest, uh, third highest grossing film in the history of cinema. Um, he has this opportunity now, moving forward, to do the same thing that Ta-Nehisi Coates did and create um, more opportunity and room with all of these characters. All right, so... Um, one thing about Marvel uh, Studios that we know moving forward is all of their stuff is back. All of the characters are back. Um, I'm not going to go in deep to that, but uh, Fox and other studios had the rights to X-Men and Spider-Man and many others. Um, and lots of new source material in the comics. Um, and so the question I want to ask of us is given the power uh, that's driven the success of, the people power that's driven the success of, of, of Black Panther, um, is what will we demand? Uh, with, with people power together um, and the, n recognizing the power of cinema and of, of cinema that represents us all, um, we have the power to, to change some things in, in how uh, characters are represented in, in the cinematic universe and more broadly. Um, so here's a couple bullets that, uh, that I'd suggest. Uh, some of our favorite characters I know from the crew. Okay, um, my predictions of what's gonna happen, there's some weight of expectations. Uh, copycat wannabes with less talent and intentionality. Um, and uh, I think that there's a really good chance that this is, uh, this is Marvel and Disney conquer the world and that um, huge changes in Hollywood uh, abound in the future. Um, so that's my presentation on Black Panther. <laughs> <laughs>